I don't believe you. Action. Oh my god. Dude, we're finally getting toward the end of these things. Do you feel like you learned anything from watching all these? Eh. You didn't read the novels. No. So it's just like a regular class that I took in college. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to English 332. I am your host, Professor Matt Cohen, and this, my friends, is the birth of the American novel. It's our final lecture. We've had a very long semester, 15 weeks. Who the hell thought that was a good idea? I don't think there were 15 weeks. Did you have 15 weeks, Dan, when you were in school? There's no way. Did you, did you, did you even go for 15 weeks or did you just leave? Probably went every once in a while, but I mean... <laughs> it added up to about 10. Yeah. Listen, before I get started on this kind of synoptic look back, on what we've been doing this semester. I want to remind you about the evaluations. Please fill those out. But also, I have added a discussion topic to the Canvas site. Um, and uh, I'd like it if you'd let me know there, for the sake of future generations of students who will take this class, which are the works that we read that um, I must absolutely keep on the syllabus by all means, and which, if you could eliminate one of them and save people pain in the future, which one would you take off? Which one would you vote off the island? This is very helpful to me. This course has changed a lot over the years thanks to input from students. I'm saying input as a polite term. Um, and uh, I'll leave the commenting on so that you can respond to each other. If you see somebody has deep sixed something that you think really ought to be kept, give a, give a reason for that. That'd be great to see. Um, not everybody is going to agree on this, um, and that will help me as I make decisions in the future. In the future. Okay, that was democracy. That's like a, it's like a mini democracy. One of the few democratic aspects of higher education. All right, so we have covered a lot of historical and artistic ground in this course, um, starting with the late 18th century, just after the American Revolution, and going all the way to the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance, modernism, and the kind of coming into its own of American literature as a global literary phenomenon. I want to briefly summarize and re-describe some of the ground that we've gone over to, maybe kind of from a slightly different lens, and starting with the different theories of the novel that we've encountered and ending with the questions that I think these novels still raise for us today, that is to say that they raised and didn't answer. What makes a novel? I mean, our everyday sense that we started with that this long fictional prose narrative with a relatively unified plot, it, it kind of changed over the course of the century. Novels become really popular um, over that time and people begin to experiment with the form. They make them shorter, they make them longer, they start to mix different kinds of approaches to it, they mix a lot of different mediums in there. Um, and it's really key in the development of nationalism, as we saw. But also, we saw, in the maintenance or in the transformation of class boundaries, in the distinctions between um, high literature and lowbrow literature, popular literature, sensational literature. We saw a contest going on over what the novel could do to the shape of society. We could look at the novel from a distance standpoint. We can see how the novel functions in politics across national boundaries. For example, we saw in Charlotte Temple this question, was it an American novel? Was it a British novel? Was it more about kind of a conjunction between a male-centric legal regime and gendered social practices, and therefore it wasn't really about any specific national context? Um, we found that the novel, in the case of the Blythdale Romance, for example, or in the case of um, Life in the Iron Mills, was a middle-class form. It was designed, for the most part, to reinforce a middle-class vision of the world. But then again, there are those working-class heroes in The Killers, Life in the Iron Mills, and even in Sutton Griggs's Imperium and Imperio. And those novels, with the very different approaches that they took, their refusal of certain kinds of formalities in language, they're very, um, they're very present in The Blythdale Romance, for example. So those other novels suggested that the novel as a form is always taking on new features, new strategies, and potentially new audiences. It can be long or short. It's common to see it using poetry or newspaper language or dialogue or songs uh, in the course of telling a story. 
Now, we also read Toni Morrison's essay, uh, Romancing the Shadow, in which she reminded us something else about American novels. For Morrison, the novel was built on a differential racial binary. American literature of the period that we have been studying was obsessed with race, she says, and the Africanist presence in it helped shape white readers' hopes and their deepest fears. Even if it didn't have any obviously black characters, uh, for example, in the case of Blythedale Romance, a novel was shaped by racial culture and a binary model of race that had the burden of assuaging guilt and doubt about slavery, or upholding a social regime that was fundamentally inequitable. So, the novel has been made to speak to questions of historical change, of nationalism, of race, class, and gender. But as we saw, the novelists themselves were also theorizing novel writing itself. They were coming up with new ideas about what it meant to write a novel and how changing form and style and content, three of those four main ingredients we've been kind of tracing this whole semester, how changing those could change what a novel could be imagined to do. Now, here James Weldon Johnson's autobiography of an ex-colored man is really interesting. It suggested, even with its modern prose, how, while some things might change, a lot of things have stayed the same, especially the prevalence of race as a boundary to social and economic success. Charlotte Temple's narrator warns us that she's not trying to write a masterpiece. She knows the novel is a form that many readers at that time were suspicious about, thought might be bad for you, and that its ability to pull the heartstrings might not please critics, but that's precisely, she says, why she needs this form. The sentimental romance made an argument about how culture worked, how people's minds could change through the engagement of the emotions and making gender politics central to the novel's drama. In Hobomok, we saw a different approach. This was the historical novel, a rich depiction of a historically specific but distant time and place allowed for the dramatization of this kind of democratic collaboration in which we can all get along despite religious differences, one of the dreams of the American Constitution. This came, however, at the cost of American Indian freedom. Irrationality surrounded the Indian. It seems to be provoked by him in these novels. Alongside the birth of the vanishing Indian myth is the rise of the historical novel in America, claiming the colonial origins of the United States and offering an answer to the problem that you may remember Sidney Smith posed that question, who reads an American book? At one level, Hawthorne's Blythedale romance ruthlessly argues against the feminizing of the novel that we might see in Lydia Maria Child's uh, use of strong female characters in Hobomok when he depicts Zenobia in Blythedale romance. But at the same time, Blythedale romance absorbs Zenobia's favorite genre, the fantasy tale. And when Coverdale turns away from poetry to prose, it kind of argues for the novel as a superior literary form. It's a moment of transformation where Hawthorne is sort of grasping, like, this might be the future, even though he's a short story writer and an allegorist. Hawthorne's a master manipulator of the formal tactics available to novelists, and he uses the first-person narration of Coverdale, however annoying he might be, to systematically undermine idealism, history, sympathy, and even reason. None of these fully functions with Coverdale as our narrator. And even the classic marriage plot in which the irrationality of love leads to the restoration of orderly, reasonable social order. Even that marriage plot is befouled by the taint of suicide, crushed utopian dreams, and Priscilla's empty personality. A profound skepticism shapes Hawthorne's approach to the novel. Now, certainly, if they share anything, Hobomock and Blydale romance create truth illusions, just like Charlotte Temple did. But they didn't apologize for the novel's form, the way Susanna Rosen had to. The suspicions of the anonymous reader of confessions and experience of a novel reader ultimately lost the battle, as the novel became a mainstream form and began to be as popular as poetry had been. By Sutton Griggs's time, the novel was a mainstay of politicized writing. It made perfect sense for him to make arguments against the racialism of his culture, using this fantastic story of these two monolithic black men who come to oratorical power and duke it out at the end of that novel. But even there, we saw Griggs fighting back against the negative uses of dialect fiction, as Imperium turns away from that popular racist form to an all-black world, intensely political and relentlessly tragic. 
There's a glimmer of science fiction and fantasy in Griggs' work with his imagined shadow empire of black legislators, coupled with a slight return to an older mode of novel writing, a fictional world, but one designed, like Charlotte Temple, to help his readers live better lives, to help them take control of words and their world. In Mark Twain, we saw another example of dialect fiction being used not to depict superficial versions of African Americans, but something much more complex. But unlike Griggs, Mark Twain, borrowing a trick from Hawthorne, refuses to give us clear moral conclusions. Twain also uses the historical fiction mode very differently from how Lydia Maria Child did. He forces this cognitive dissonance, this, this struggle in your mind, in his readers, by attacking slavery in a time when slavery had already passed. By implication, he suggests, the novel has the power to make people not just feel warm and cozy about the nation's past, but in fact, to interrogate how its injustices live on in the present. How that fundamental contradiction of an American freedom and democracy, built on slavery and economic equality, could be continuing to undermine that utopian dream of an America that is the most awesome thing. James Weldon Johnson's modernist approach was to pit one long narrative genre against another in his readers' minds, autobiography versus the novel. Once again, fiction leads us to the highest truths, as Johnson's narrator argues it. But by the back door, as we saw, questions about class re-enter, even as the racial drama seems to be taking center stage. Nationalism is intensely questioned in autobiography of an ex-colored man, as is the notion of progress. So we're back to where we started. Does the novel inevitably help to create nations? Does the novel's attachment to the present inevitably lead it to thematize progress? Does it, by virtue of its attempts to challenge the norm, um, lead us to some kind of radically different future? Or does it lead us back to those things that are kind of normal, re-centering the desires that all of us have to connect with each other? It seems clear that the definition of a novel is more of a conversation than it is a given thing. It's an occasion for thinking about culture, rather than a myth or some kind of template for how things work. But I do think that these novels offer more than just a window onto the history of the United States, or the history of the novel, or theories about novels. Because these texts are still read today. Because they've had long lives. They've resurged at one time or another. They've appealed to subsequent generations, and then sometimes they've disappeared for a while, as artistic tastes and the problems on people's minds have changed. And because of this, I think, these novels ask us questions that we haven't yet agreed on the answers to. So in Charlotte Temple's case, what is the relationship between pleasure and virtue, between feeling good, right, and doing the right thing? You should get along. say between feeling good and doing good. Oh, that's nice. In Charlotte Temple, for example, what is the relationship between pleasure and virtue? That is to say, what is the relationship between feeling good and doing good? I'd like to thank my brother for that formulation. It was very elegant. In Hobomock, is the unity of Anglo-American settler culture inextricably based on the vanishing of the Indian? What is to be the other side, the beyond, the perfect relationship between the people who are indigenous to this land and the people who have come here, whether under their own power or not? In The Killers, where do we draw the line between envisioning the unity of all working people and appreciating cultural difference? Can novels keep us all on the same page, as it were? Or do they have to pretend that some things are more important than others? Do they have to take a position that ultimately creates an other or creates someone who is put in a lower position or dismissed. In The Blythedale Romance, how are we to understand or to navigate the relationship between an individual personality and a collective communal vision, that, that thing that Coverdale seems so spectacularly to fail in being able to do? And Life in the Iron Mills, which also points right at that question, what is the power of fiction to change the world? Does it do that by changing our hearts first, by appealing to our sense of justice? Or does it simply reflect the cold, hard facts of the world to us and leave those questions in our hands? In Griggs's Imperium and Imperio, how are black people to enter the public sphere as equals given the complex politics of race, both within black culture and between black people and the rest of society? Puddinhead Wilson, 
What are the fictions of law and custom of today that may be enacting the kinds of arbitrary injustices that racial slavery did in the past? Autobiography of an ex-colored man. What indeed is the best position from which to view a culture? He is caught in this space in between and seems to have a unique way of looking both at white people and at black people. But then at the end, to him, it's this depressing having given up on what he was given, um, his racial heritage and, and a kind of unique set of artistic properties that he feels that he, he never quite grasped. So is that is that that position beyond everybody else from which you can judge? Is that even the right thing to be seeking? The novel seems to ask. And through these questions, American novels up to 1920 connect the struggles of the past to the struggles of today. And here is where you all come in. You are, as I said at the very beginning, the future. And you now have a sense of where some of the language that you speak comes from. Where are some of the tensions that you're experiencing today, every day, whether it's in the media or whether it's on the street or whether you're just sitting down at lunch, where those tensions came from and how some Americans in the past have tried to respond to them, have tried to ask folks to change their minds, have tried to give us a new vocabulary, a new set of concepts through which we might think about addressing those problems. So I put this in your hands as folks who have a chance to make a better future out of a dark but an also beautiful past. Thanks for being with me this semester. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Action. Fine. God, only a couple of pages left and I'm dying.